Welcome to this episode of Horrific History and Hauntings. I'm Beth. And I'm Ramey. We're your hosts, here to talk about the stories that history books ignore. From horrific epidemics and ghostly hauntings to the catastrophes and tragic events that have sickened humanity. You told me what we're covering this week. It's going to be exploding coffins. Well, it's not just that, because there's not too much for that, so I decided to go into different... Well, lucky for us, (laughs) we don't have many exploding coffins. Different historical events and how different funerals, burials, mourning in different cultures okay as well so there's not much about exploding caskets because there wasn't much to say about that it would have been a very short episode (laughs) we've had a couple of incidents (laughs) but other than that we can just shove it under the rug yeah (laughs) the whole thing's gonna be kind of all over the place but i'm just gonna spew out some facts the first burials may have taken place as long as fifty thousand years ago the oldest known intentional burial sites is in Israel and dates back to almost 10,000 years. Were the other ones 50,000 years ago mistaken burials, avalanche kind of things? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they just didn't have specific rituals or oh, the anything ritual part, like that. Yeah. Maybe they just kind of left the bodies there, maybe. I really don't know. Yeah, just throw some dirt over them and walk off. Yeah. No ceremony to it. Early humans buried their dead in caves. Remains were placed in coffins with various items such as food, trinkets, and garments. And it's thought that the remains were painted before they were put into the coffins. Painted? Yeah. Like their nails? With, no, their faces and I guess the whole thing. Oh. With like clay and other elements, dirt maybe. Pigment of some sort? Yeah, whatever Mm. they had back then. Okay. A big feast would be prepared to celebrate the passing. Most were buried in groups such as families, and some sites had separate areas for children. I mean, that's still a thing now. I know our local town cemetery, the older section, has a child cemetery section just for the children. Yeah. I wonder if they have fixed that. I mean, they're not going to dig them up and move them, Beth. No, I mean the one that was... All messed up? All messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Coffins were sometimes stacked. The remains would be pushed to the side to make room for new ones. Sounds like a catacomb. Yeah, but also, from what I understand, like in New Orleans, they will push remains to the back to put, place new relatives. A family crypt. In there, yeah. Sometimes the coffins on the bottom would collapse under the weight of the ones on top. In Mesopotamia and Egypt is where we're going next. The people of Babylonia, it was believed that the souls of the departed went to the underworld. The dead were buried in the ground so they could have access to their next home. They were buried close to where they lived so survivors could bring offerings to the site, such as food and beverages, and buried with belongings they may need in the afterlife. Very Egyptian. Mm-hmm. Because Egypt is hot and arid, making mummies was ne- necessary yeah. um, to prevent them from rotting and drawing disease to the living. Pyramids were tombs where pharaohs were buried, only used by royalty usually, and only for a brief period of the Egyptian history. Burial sites for most people, were on the western side of the Nile. They also had large funeral processions. Now we're going to skip to the Greek and Roman. Greeks believed spirits left the body as a breath of air. It was important to get the body to the underworld as quickly as possible so the spirit could get there safely. Let's just hop on down the river sticks, I guess. The body was anointed in oil and wrapped in a shroud, and a coin was placed under the tongue to be given to Sharon. Karen. Karen? The ferryman for the dead. I know this part. I was a Greek lover. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I love the Greek stories. I'm not a Greek lover. <laughs> well, <laughs> the ferryman of the river Styx, the boundary between our world and the underworld. The body was laid out for mourning, and before dawn or a day or two after death, a funeral procession would take place. They would carry the deceased to either their final resting place for burial or a funeral pyre for release to the Olympian gods. They would go to the Olympian gods and immediately push down into Hades. I guess really isn't an Olympian god. He's like one, but he never stays there. Grave sites were marked by tombs, columns, or statues, which were brightly painted, and Greeks placed high value on immortality. I do too. It was believed that preservation of the memory served this purpose, and a lot of great Greek art has resulted from the desire to preserve the memory of the dead. And I looked this up. There's pretty interesting art that has, I don't know what they're called, but like terracotta vases. And there's what would look like 
mosaic art? Um, There's no. paintings on these. Um, vases. Yes. Pretty paintings on pretty vases, <laughs> but there's also these things that look like, I guess you would say a tombstone maybe back then, and there was pretty cool art. And then they also had statues that came from this. Family and friends were encouraged to grieve, and although not too violently, I'm not sure why they had to put that down. I don't know if it was a problem if they were violent during grieving at some point. That was put down, so I figured it was interesting to note. I mean, I guess I've seen some people who grieve violently in their own way. Yeah. Uh, I guess you grieve in your own way. Yeah, that's what they say. I'm not one of those. I was looking into it, and I want to say it was Cherokee tribe. Also had a mourning period, but you were not allowed to be angry during that time. How dare you feel angry? Which I want to go more into... Maybe later on into another episode, I want to look that up because they also had some interesting rituals and things going uh, on. Even now, there's a certain amount of decorum when someone dies that you go to a funeral home or wherever you go. Yeah, you shouldn't be like flipping over the casket and no making a mess. No. It's just not appropriate. The social mobility of the Roman life allowed many people, even former slaves, to become wealthy. They celebrated their abundance and freedom with lavish funerary art depicting crowded funeral parades. Isn't that a thing kind of like New Orleans? They have funeral parades? The jazz parades? funeral. I'll go more into the New Orleans jazz okay. funerals. I mean, later it's not near Rome, but still. Yeah, but I imagine maybe not jazz, but <laughs> it was. <laughs> the, the popular Roman jazz <laughs> fad. The earliest Celtic culture is referred to as the Urnfield culture. Named so because they were cremated and then buried in urns. I mean, that's popular now, too. If your family didn't want to put you on the mantle. As the Bronze and Iron Ages progressed, Hallstatt, Hallstatt culture developed, followed by Latin culture. I know how to say the second one. First one, I'm not sure. Both okay. showed the roots of burial practices of the Celts. I know nothing about this. I don't either. That's why I'm not only going to mispronounce a lot, but... I wanted to go somewhat into it. And like I said, the ones that I found more interesting, I went more into the ones that you I was having trouble with. I just put the basics that I found down. They were all somewhat important to put a little bit in. Both Hostalt and Latine traded with Greece and buried their dead with personal items. Some very valuable items. I thought you were going to say that. They traded their corpses with... <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, just items. Some very valuable items which were obtained through trade. The Aunt Ruth, <laughs> no. <laughs> the Hallstatt culture laid their dead out in carts with earthly valuables and food after they would have a large feast in honor of the dead. The feast is a normal thing for most of them. It still is. It still is. Like, you're hungry, I guess. You're hungry. Morning's hard. You've done broke a table and tossed a casket Which if you're angry. also brings me back to the Cherokee thing. I didn't write any of those notes down for this, for the Cherokee thing. But apparently during the morning period, they would only intake light foods. A place for the deceased was laid out and songs and poems were sang in their homes. The body would often be burned after the feast and remains would be placed in the urns and buried. Family and friends would memorialize the dead by placing a stone at the site. A gravestone. Yes. We still have that too. Yes, we do. Now we're moving on to Hindu. A Hindu funeral takes place almost immediately after death, by dusk or dawn, whichever comes first. I like that. Nice and quick. I enjoy that. That's how my death should be, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no importance is placed on the body. I mean, that makes good sense. Yes, because it's... It's a body. It's just a body. It is seen only as a vessel for the soul. It's anointment with oils, incense, and water from the sacred Ganges. Ganges? Ganges? Ganges River. They would also chant over the body, and the body would be bathed, wrapped in a cloth, and presented with offerings to be cremated. Bodies were burned on a pyre at a sacred site with things they may need to meet the gods. Ideally, they would do this near the banks of the Ganges River. At some points in Hindu history, these valuables would also include the wives and servants of the male deceased. Oh, dear. 
a historical Hindu practice where the widow of the deceased would sacrifice herself by sitting on the pyre with her deceased husband. Okay, and I also read that at first this was probably just a thing where she did it willingly, but then there was also a part where they were forced to do it. And then there were laws made against it after this. Yeah. And it was said that there would be death punishment if they were caught doing this. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? Oh, if they're death forced punishment to do it. for yeah, if they're forced to do it, the person <laughs> that is in charge. Yeah. Would definitely be yeah, punished. Don't be don't be tossing people on the fire just because their husband died. No. It, you probably well, shouldn't willingly be sitting on it either. No, I wouldn't advise it. It's not safe. N- well, I think that's the point. Yeah. But don't toss somebody in the fire even if their husband didn't die. Don't be tossing people in a in a fire. Don't be willingly catching yourself on fire. No. We do not condone that behavior. It's hard to imagine a worse way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Ashes were collected and thrown into the Ganges on the third day. The family would enter a mourning period of about 12 days. And during this time, they were considered impure. And after the mourning period, there was a feast. I remember a while back, I watched a thing on the BBC or read about it. I can't remember if I watched it or read it, yeah. but they did say that they had a problem. They had to ban people tossing bodies into the river, mm-hmm. but they had to ban it because it was swollen with bodies is what the, the article said. So it's still a thing. It's just not supposed to be happening because of all the pollution. And it's, it's unsanitary, technically. I mean, all the people living along the river. Of course and- it's unsanitary. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of unsanitary things to I, come. I could see the ashes being a thing, but apparently there's they just throw a whole body. Just throwing in there. a whole body. Yeah. Oh dear. Okay. India's holiest river is swollen with bodies. I found the article at the BBC just now. Yeah. And I trust the BBC. It's the one I go to. Now we're going into East and Southeast Asia. Later on, it'll be. It, we'll just say Asia. Many ancient spiritual beliefs in Eastern Asia centered upon ancestors. Many cultures, the spirits of the deceased still had influence over the events in the world. They needed to be appeased, or it was believed that they would cause mischief. Your relatives really don't like being ignored. I don't. No, I don't either. I'm still alive, so I will haunt you if you ignore me when I'm dead. I'll put you on the mantle. (laughs) Many cultures helped guide those who were dying into a peaceful death by whispering Buddhist scriptures in their ear. After death, the body would be bathed and placed in a coffin with flowers and burial items to wait for cremation. Cremation is a popular thing, and I personally like it more than burial. Yes. This would take place as soon as possible because they also place little value upon the body after death. It could be delayed so that long-distance loved ones could have time to show up and pay their respects, though. I'd imagine it's a common thing no matter where you are, as long as the infrastructure is there to get word around. Early Cambodians and Indonesians believed in reincarnation. They had ceremonial funeral pyres with special structures built for the occasion. China had many elaborate rituals, not only for funerals, but for after. It was believed that children owed a duty to their parents and the dead could still influence the living. And when they can if they're clogging up your river. Yeah, that's going to cause some problems. So feng shui was developed in part to help identify the best places for burials. I didn't know that. I thought it was all about your house. I didn't know that either. I'm not much of a feng shui person. I'm oh. more of a, if it's useful, I'm going to use it. I'm going to keep it. I'm not much of a decorator, to be honest. Like, I have a few items that I keep for memory reasons. The Chinese would send burial offerings ahead of the spirit, and representations of earthly belongings might have been buried with them. Representations, like an effigy. They didn't actually send off the good China. <laughs> We're going to give you the cheap china. Take the guest set. For example, the terracotta soldiers. I'm so sorry when I mispronounced this. Um, Chen Shi Wang, the ancient Chinese emperor, was buried with these. Yes, the terracotta soldiers. Yes, that's the example. In Japan, bodies were placed in barrels or clay pots and buried. Because Japan is an island nation, funeral processions often carried the deceased on carts shaped like a boat. Kind of Viking when you think about it. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe Viking is kind of, it's probably just a seafaring thing when you think about yeah. that. You yeah. have to do with the sea. You're yeah, going to be in a boat. The Vikings did it. I, well, we always heard the Vikings did it. I don't know. And now I find out Japan does it. It just seems like a seafaring person kind of thing. Buried at sea, even if you're not technically around the sea. 
Well, the part that sticks out to me is the bodies were placed in barrels. Yeah. Did you ever watch Game of Thrones? Mm-hmm. Master Aemon, the old Targaryen, mm-hmm. when he died, they shoved him in a barrel of rum, I believe, so he wouldn't go bad on the boat. Did it work? I believe so. Was that in the show, or did I just remember that from the books? I remember they shoving you Master Aemon in a, in a barrel. It's been a while since I've watched it, so I don't know. I get them mixed up in the last couple of seasons on the show. were just so all over the place. Yeah, it was. So, China, Indonesia, Philippines. This is also part of this section, but this is... I mean, Japan should have been part of that, too. If you look closely at the sides of the cliffs and mountains, you can see coffins hanging from them. Some being hundreds of years old. Hanging from a cliff. It looks like they would have fallen and rotted. Some of them do. Oh, don't stand under the cliffs. <laughs> yeah. The elderly would carve their own coffins out of hollowed logs, and if they were too weak or ill, the relatives would prepare the coffins for them. Okay. That's a lot of work. Yeah. For an elderly, too. The dead are placed inside the coffin. Sometimes their bones would be broken in the process of getting (laughs) them to fit in, because they want them to fit in in a fetal position. You know, we still have to do that now. If you get a particularly tall person, they have to sever the legs. Disturbing. It is. (laughs) It's true. But it happens. The coffins would then be brought to a cave for burial. Wait, I thought you said they put them on cliffs. They are either hung inside the caves or on the face of the cliffs. Okay. You know, when I was playing Elder Scrolls Oblivion, a lot of caves had, uh, if they had undead running around in them, the interior of the cave, certain big rooms would have sticks sticking out of a stone wall (laughs) with coffins on them. You better not have a fear of heights if you're going to be burying your loved one. Oh, no. They're going to be stuck at the top of the cliff. I'm terrified of heights. They're going to be stuck at the top of the cliff because I'm going to be like, no, we're not doing this. I'm still alive and I plan on staying this way. Mm -hmm. So love you, but no. I would love a statistic that told you how many died Mm -hmm. trying to hang their loved ones. They would normally be hanging next to their ancestors from the cliff. You don't want to hang out with people you don't know. Now, another mispronunciation, I'm sure. Sagata. Sagata? Sagata. I think it's Sagata. People have been practicing this for over 2,000 years. What is it? The hanging coffins. Okay. I didn't know that's what it was called. <laughs> We've just been talking about it. Over time, coffins will deteriorate and fall from their hanging positions. I imagine taking bones and such with them. I also read that it is considered bad karma to walk under the coffins, but I feel like they probably made this rule as well, because who wants to be walking, just cr- taking a stroll, and all of a sudden a coffin and some remains fall on your head. And you said it was carved out of a solid log. Yeah, so it's not- going it- to deteriorate. It's not no small coffin. <laughs> no. It- it- I would imagine the uh, little wooden po- pegs that hold it up are going to rot before the massive log, and then you have a massive log. And yeah, the weight. Of it. Yeah, the weight and then remains and a log come crashing down on you. The reason for the hanging of the coffins is believed that the higher the dead was placed, the greater chance the spirits would reach a higher nature in the afterlife. Well, good job. We just have to get them up to the top of the cliff and no farther. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going on to the Americas, like North America, South America, that area. Yeah. Native Americans in North America generally believed the soul would leave the body with help from rituals. The belief was that it takes four days for the soul to ascend to happiness. The Sioux tribe would wait a year to bury their dead, storing bodies dressed in their finest clothes inside of hollow trees. I don't really know what to say about that. It makes you think about these cases that you read about where they randomly find bodies in trees. Mm Mm-hmm. I've never read about that, Beth. Oh, well, (laughs) there's one. They call the person Bella. They don't know who she was, but I don't think this was her because I think they actually found an age that she probably wouldn't be part of that. But So she was just a corpse in a tree. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they know she was murdered, if I'm not mistaken. Uh Uh-oh. The Iroquois had mourning wars for warriors (laughs) that were lost in battle. Okay. They would raise the enemy and... Not raise. I made a typo. They're all necromancers. 
<laughs> they would raid the enemy. Oh, literal wars. Yeah, like an actual war. I was thinking like a reenactment. <laughs> no, they would raid the enemy and take one of their members captive to replace the life in the trot that was lost. Wow, you just don't bother breeding. You just bring in someone else. <laughs> Who am I to judge? Do it however you want. I don't know. Aztecs believed sending items such as livestock and even slaves to the afterlife with the dead in tombs. That's a very Egyptian, you know, pyramids, uh, murdering people when you die kind of thing. That's The, the Egyptians did the same. I think it was considered sacrificing. Uh, yes. But yes, murder. It's all about perspective, I'm sure. <laughs> Mayans buried their dead under their houses. Important people had elaborate tombs with masks, gems, food, and slaves offered with them. The direction of the corpse was facing also was determined by the manner of death. Wow, that's novel for me. I've never heard of that either. A green stone was placed in the mouth because it represented the heart where the soul was believed to reside. Cool. I don't know. What I wonder it- if they just had a bunch of green stones laying around or if they had to go hunt for a green stone every time. Incas, due to living in frigid high altitudes, would mummify their bodies. They would be brought out for special occasions, especially if they were important people. It was thought that a person wasn't truly dead unless they were forgotten or somehow rendered irrelevant, which I find kind of rude because the doctor says the most average people can be the most important. Some good life lessons from the doctor there. Yep. So kind of rude that you're like, oh, they're not important. You don't get to get brought back. Yeah. Maybe you're just so bad. He who must not be remembered. (laughs) (laughs) He who must not be named. Mummified remains were treated as advisors. And due to high altitudes, they accomplished mummification by drying them out in the cold. Travelers would strip the flesh from the corpses of their dead to make them easier to carry with them. Me personally, I'm lazy. I would probably just leave them and say, the snow and cold will take care of it. We're moving on to jazz funerals. In New Orleans... But I believe it was Roots of West Africa is where it came from. Your guess is as good as mine. I want to say that's what it was. Typically, jazz funerals begin at a church or a funeral home, and they lead the way to the cemetery. Mourners are joined by a brass band that plays music, which starts off sad, but soon turns happier, as if more of a celebration of life, and everybody dances. Awesome. Yeah. It's been a tradition since the late 1800s. The band leads the way for the hearse or the vehicle carrying the coffin, followed by the mourners who attended the memorial service. Onlookers who didn't attend the service are also welcome to join the dancing and singing in the street. They are required to march behind the mourners who did attend the service, though, which I think this is a music term. They go to the second line. Either a music term or a parade term. Maybe. I I don't know anything about those, but it said second line, so I felt like it was important to put that in there. Yeah. People in the second line are often seen with photos of the deceased, whistles, hats, umbrellas, and other items of celebration. But you just they're onlookers. They're just folks who you yeah, happen to pass. Yeah, but they want to join the celebration so of someone, life. So who's the person handing out photos of the dead? In the group. I don't know, unless they just want to take pictures. I mean, yeah, cool. Photographer, maybe. From the grave site, the procession may go back to where it started or where the reception takes place. Where I'd imagine there's good foods waiting. It's New Orleans. The food is great there. Yeah. It is wonderful. So I would definitely be dancing my way to that area. Maybe to get there first, you should be one of the people who stay for the whole service first. Maybe. Now we're going into Queen Victoria's influence on modern funerals. I didn't even know she had any. Yep, she had an influence. Black clothing was established as the dress code for the funerals following the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. It was customary during that Victorian period to wear black mourning clothes for a set period of time following the funeral of a loved one. The relationship of the person established how long one would wear the black clothing. This could be years if it was your spouse who passed away. No, no. You imagine how hot it got. Yeah. In some areas where it stays hot, New Orleans being one of those areas, I can't imagine wearing full length, multiple layers of black clothing. No. Not that that would really have anything to do with that area, but I'm just. If I'm not mistaken, the Victorian era also. Parts of Africa were under the British Empire's control. Can you imagine 
heat the, strokes. It, there it, must have been many You didn't have strokes. to wear it for years because you would be gone. It just You would just <laughs> faint over and go. Yeah. Morning jewelry actually became popular at this time as well. You hear now, I don't know if you get them on your TikTok for you page, but I get advertisements for you make ashes of a loved one into a jewel. Well, this isn't quite like that, but it's kind of. This jewelry would just include a picture of the person or it would have a lock of the deceased's hair. If you look them up, it's actually pretty. Pretty. I mean, yeah, it's Victorian era <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's, really it, it's actually really pretty. Going into history of funeral processions, ancient Rome, professional mourners were hired to weep and wail loudly. Not angrily, though. What's well, banned? Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> In Rome? I believe that was the one, wasn't it? Maybe. I think so. Music was played during the procession, and it was thought the louder the procession is, the more powerful the, and important the person was. In Europe, catacombs were being used to store the dead the largest being in Paris, France. And it's thought that some 6 million people are said to be buried in these tunnels, which I would like to visit that. I'm pretty sure they played a big role during the World War II for the uh, resistance. Possibly. Also, it's where the theater of the vampires stayed. <laughs> Within the first century following the death of Jesus, the Romans are said to be the first to make use of columbariums. Columbariums? I think that's the word. Their buildings are rooms used to store urns. Store urns? Mm -hmm. So they cremated them as well. I guess so. Or they shoved you in a jar. Or, yeah, I get, they might have done that. I don't think it's probably what they've done. In North America, some native tribes used earthen mounds to bury their dead. Some you can still see today. Some are actually in Ohio. Oh, we went to Ohio. Yeah. It's a just to visit the Mothman, so we went across the bridge. Yeah. You have to go across the bridge. No, we went into Ohio for no reason. If uh, you go, you should cross the bridge. Oh, yeah, you should cross the bridge. For a long time, funerals were held in private homes. Families would care for their dead. Um, this began to change during the Civil War when bodies were being embalmed to be shipped home for burial. See, I did not know that's when they started being embalmed. Uh, well, they had to keep them. I just assumed they left them, them buried them on the spot or something. I really didn't know. I think some of them did, especially the ones that they didn't know who they were. That's also when the more park-like cemeteries began. The undertakers began taking care of the deceased, um, which were later called morticians. And in the 1900s, the term funeral director. We have, I think, a funeral director in the family now. Do we? Oh, Yeah. I'm pretty sure she's a funeral director. I know she works in a funeral home. So now we're going into more of the types of funerals and burials you can get, especially nowadays. Green funerals are becoming more popular nowadays. It's a lot cooler than the Victorian era garb, I'm sure. Well, it's not really about the mourning. It's just the burials, mostly. It's said North America, but I imagine this is probably happening elsewhere as well yeah what is it <laughs> <laughs> it's options that are better for the environment so there's no embalming fluids chemicals or processes that could harm the environment instead i want to say that they use some sort of essential oils to try to <laughs> let me cover you in some amber <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can be resurrected by some scientific necromancer in the future <laughs> gonna be resurrected but um you're not going to be properly embalmed, which is fine. Cremation's the way to go. Yeah. But this also, cremation, they say, where you're burning something also leaves a carbon footprint. It's not really about yeah. that. Just ship me off to the body farm, I guess. I'll just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you'll be useful. Doing my civic duty, and I believe it's free. Well, you're dead. I would hope so. Um, I think you're, yeah, you're donating the body. Yeah. So I doubt you have to pay for anything. Yeah, that's a good choice for people who don't want to spend anything and put their body to good use. Yeah. Either biodegradable caskets are used or the body will be wrapped in a cotton shroud and just simply placed in the ground without a casket. I'm assuming wood would be the... Yeah, biodegradable. They yeah. just went retro, I bet. I don't know anything about this, though. I do know that the shroud seems like it would make, make less of an impact. Yeah. But in, I want to say it was a cotton shroud is okay. what they would use. You can also choose to have memorial services. Those are available for this. You can have burials in conservation parks where families can plant a variety of plants and flowers and shrubs on the grave. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like that one. Now we're going into more fun. 
funeral strippers. Oh, no. <laughs> it's located in China, but mostly common in Taiwan. Extravagant large funerals is a sign of wealth and social status. Some families hire electric flower cars with dancers, which will dance all the way to the graveside of the deceased. I looked up electric flower car because I didn't know what that was. There are trucks or other vehicles with bright neon lights, and they have mobile stages for the strippers to dance on. It's a parade float. They turn it into a parade float, pretty much. Cool. The China government has been more restrictive on these funeral strippers. They've made laws to prevent it and say it's uncivilized. Some continue to do it, though. It's a big country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to say they probably do it in more rural areas where it's yeah. not as noticeable. But the government has set up a hotline for the public to report those who that have hired funeral strippers in exchange for rewards. Oh, I wonder how much they offer. <laughs> now, I couldn't find anything about Taiwan having any restrictions or making laws about it. So I think it's yeah. more of a common thing there. Now to the Amazon, eating the dead. And another word that I'm going to mispronounce, Yanomami, Yanomami, Yanomami. <laughs> it's a tribe in the Amazon. I don't know how to pronounce this. I, I don't know. I tried. I listened to it. And even after listening to it, I was like, this is. But anyway, it's a tribe in the Amazon. When a member dies, they consume the ashes as a way of keeping the spirit alive in the surviving members. They believe the body must be burned and eaten by the relatives in order for the spirit to rest peacefully. Okay. I mean, at least it's the ashes. Ashes are mixed into the other ingredients to make a soup. Hmm. The entire tribe eats some of the soup. They don't believe that death is a natural occurrence in life. They believe a rival tribe has sent a evil spirit to directly strike someone in the tribe. Prior to cremation, members cover the body in leaves and put it in a forest nearby. After allowing nature to take its course for 30 to 45 days, they collect the bones and cremate them. And that's where they get the ashes. You're not supposed to leave meat out for that long, unrefrigerated especially. You're not supposed to leave meat out more than a few hours. Yeah. I, I don't know how that would work. Mm -mm. But like I said, there's also other ways. Like some areas, they'll eat the brain of or the actual flesh of their members for different reasons. But like I said, that's a whole other episode that I would have to get into. Now, this one's a little bit shorter. Space burials. Rockets blast the cremated remains of individuals into space. I've seen that this could be an extremely short burial as one head has exploded recently. Was there anybody on it? I don't think anybody was on that, were they? I don't know. I just seen where it exploded. I'd assumed that they would yeah, have... Why would that. they launch it if nobody, well, remains on it? I don't know. That's a lot of money, I'd imagine. Was it four remains? I just seen something about one of them exploding. I didn't... Yeah. It's still traumatic, I imagine. A, a whole but, other trauma for you. Yeah. I read that the remains actually just go around and come back to Earth I, as to not become part of a space waste. Do they not just disintegrate in the atmosphere? Are they heavy enough to cause that to happen? I really don't know. I don't know personally at all about that, but I read in one of the sources that they brought them back so that they wouldn't become like space waste. That's okay. That takes a lot more work than just shooting a rocket into space. I also read that one person, their ashes were either spread on the moon or they were spread out into space. So there is one apparently out there somewhere. In 1997, the first space memorial with the American company Celestics. Mm -hmm. That's it. That that took place in 1997. That was a lot farther back than I would have thought. Yeah. But several famous celebrities and icons have chosen this type of burial or memorial, such as astronauts and the creator of Star Trek. Well, Star Trek one makes sense. Yes, it does. There's also more information about that. Other characters... Or, I guess, actors and actresses of Star Trek yeah. have apparently done this as well. Not really a Star Trek person, so. <laughs> now to the one I want. A reef memorial. Neptune Memorials is the one that I found the most. There might be other uh, companies that do this as well. I don't know. They have created a beautiful, eco-friendly memorial reef off of the coast of Florida. Loved one's ashes are deposited as part of a living reef. It is a place for the loved ones to go visit, though... I'm guessing you probably need a boat or a scuba dive to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also good for the environment because it's creating a whole ecosystem for sea life. 
They blend the ashes with eco-friendly concrete and other eco-friendly materials. The cheapest one, it said ashes spread. So I don't know if those are mixed into the concrete or if they just spread the ashes in that area and just put that as like, instead of a tombstone, you you would just have that. But that one was only like two, three thousand dollars. That's cheaper than most and coffins. Get, yeah. And you get a certificate and you get this, I guess, tombstone under the it's not a tombstone it's actually a hollow round you would think it to me it looks like an old in finding nemo those bombs under the sea a mine yes the mines it kind of looked like that just hollow had little holes in it but something could live in there (laughs) yes that's what it's for okay each one can weigh from 750 to 3500 pounds that's how you go extravagant you just pay more for a larger hollow mine yeah. They also had some that in the pictures they didn't look like that. They were they had some that just looked like statues, but I don't know how those would work. Other ashes of loved ones, including pets, can be put in this reef so that they can rest together in the same reef. It's a family plan. They have, like I said, different ones, different I'm assuming shapes and sizes. But yeah. the cheapest one I looked at was like two to three thousand dollars, I wanna say. Reasonable. Yeah, better than most. We're going to Irish wakes now. In Ireland, the normal way how this went down, all clocks were stopped at the time of death, curtains were drawn, and mirrors were covered with black cloth, which was a sign of respect. It was also to prevent the souls of the living members from leaving their bodies too soon. They also thought the spirit could be trapped in a mirror if they saw their own reflection. Oh, that wouldn't be nice. (laughs) Deceased are laid on a table for viewing. Loved ones stay with the body around the clock to comfort the spirit of the dead. And windows must be left open so the spirit can leave the home. Not because of the smell. Probably smell. Yeah. Yeah. It's also thought that the person who closes the window would be cursed. Well, who are you going to get to do that? I guess you just leave your windows open until the corpse is gone. Oh, I thought you meant the next person in line eventually had to close the window was going to be cursed, no matter <laughs> when it was. <laughs> I don't know. If not, your window is going to be open for a long time. Candles were lit at the head and the foot of the coffin. The deceased was dressed in their best clothes, but in the past they would be wrapped in a shroud. And when removing the coffin from the home, it would be taken out with the feet first so that the spirit couldn't find their way back into the hole. They just assume you're out to get them, I guess, when you die. (laughs) Or get stuck in the mirror. I like mirrors. Uh, I wouldn't want to be stuck in one. I don't know if they still do this this way. I know it was the most common Viking funerals, I didn't put a lot in there. I feel like most people, it's, most bodies were cremated. Elite Viking fighters were buried with their boats. Vessels were filled with food, alcohol, and tributes. Mm -hmm. Once the boats were prepared, they were caught on fire and set out to sea, which was considered an ultimate otter. I mean, boats aren't easy to make. No, they had pretty nice boats too, didn't they? The long boat. Mm -hmm. Lots of rowing. And this one, Zoroastrian. That's a cool name. I think is how you say that. I don't know how to say that. (laughs) Uh, Tower of Silence. They believe that human bodies were unclean. So after death, a corpse demon is believed to have contaminated the body and everyone who comes in contact with it. Kind of like the windows. Large circular structures were made out of stones and remains were placed in this tower for vultures to consume. That's cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Over three days, loved ones gather to sing and pray over the deceased, but no one's allowed to touch the body. Demons and all. Yes. There's a ritual called viewing of the dog, where a dog looks at the body three times. Once after washing the body, the second time before the removal of the body to the tower, and then the last before the corpse enters the tower, which is supposed to drive away the evil inside the corpse. A dog? Yeah, I got plenty of dogs. I'm good. They look at me all the time. Yeah. Once the corpse bears carry the body to the tower. They place it in rows and receptacles. Men, women, and children are placed in different rows, and the bearers remove the and destroy the clothes immediately because it's considered polluted. But they use metal instruments to do so, so they don't have to touch them. They're just wearing what they were wearing when they died? I get, well, you're not allowed to touch it, so I would say so. After placing the corpse in its resting place, they will isolate themselves for nine days and nights for having direct contact with the deceased. A quarantine. Mm-hmm. Hope nobody dies between now and then. Within hours, vultures consume the dead's flesh until only bones remain. That's quick. Which, like I was talking about the body farms before, apparently it doesn't take that long. For a vulture to get a hold of you? Yeah. Oh, 
apparently they come swooping in. They're like, that's my food. And they just encourage that because they consider it a natural process and they need to study that anyway. Yes, they have some that they keep cages over so they can see how the other part of decomposition does it. The sun dries up the bones until they start to crumble after the flesh is eaten off. The bones will then become dust inside of a well inside the middle of the tower. They just kind of crumble down themselves? I figured bones would stay that, like, in that form for a while, but I don't know if they're talking about years. It might be years that they're talking about this. I, I'm just thinking of like a funnel-shaped tower now with shelves in it that tilt downwards. So when the bones get brittle enough to fall apart, they just roll off into this pit in the center. That would make it easier. It sounds very fantasy, but I don't know how else they would get there <laughs> unless someone touched that corpse. Well, later on, sometimes attendants will remove the bones to a room inside or outside the tower that stores these remains. Ah. So I'm guessing eventually they do touch them or maybe they use those metal instruments to push the bones along i don't know like i said before my geography is so bad i also read that in 1970 iran banned this practice but the tower of silence remains it must have been in iran i don't I mean, well it also says india i mean it's a whole section of the world there so. yeah it's all over the place but yeah. india the practice isn't completely lost but it is done less because cities are expanding, their borders make less space for the towers to remain isolated. And due to the lack of vultures, at one point in time, many of the vultures died off after eating carcasses of cows that were contaminated with pharmaceutical drugs. Yep, that'll do it. That's happened here in America, too. Eagle eggs and like from pesticides. Poor vultures. Now we're going on to finger amputation as a way of mourning. Is that said New Guinea? New Guinea. New Guinea. Like guinea pig? Yes. I want to say Danny tribe or Donnie tribe. Women members cut off the top of their fingers after attending a funeral. A way to drive away the spirit. This is believed the reasoning. Oh, no. It's also a form of healing. The pain of losing a finger is similar to the trauma of loss. It looks like you're just compounding that problem. <laughs> they tie a string tightly around the upper half of the finger for about 30 minutes to get it to go numb. And then the finger is removed using an axe and they would cauterize it to prevent bleeding and to form new calloused fingers. Okay, that isn't my kind of grieving. (laughs) No, I feel like I'm going through enough. If there's a death, I don't want to cut my fingers off either. The leftover piece of the finger is dried and then either burned to ashes or stored in a special place. But if I was to cut part of my finger off, I'm storing it in a special place. I'm keeping I'm keeping a jar of my fingers after every every yeah. funeral. Keep your fingers in a jar or your fingertips in a jar. Yeah. Which isn't fair because this was only for the women. That's not great. The ritual is now banned, but you can still see signs of it from the older women in the community who have mutilated fingertips. Wonder when it was banned. I'm not sure. It had to have been fairly recently. Yeah, if you're still seeing people with mutilated fingertips. Probably. No. Well, that's my least favorite one so far. Yeah, I don't want to do that one. Oh, well, then again, I also don't want to burn myself. Oh, just yeah, that's, because my that's husband my least dies. favorite one so far. In northwestern Philippines, blindfolding was a thing. The dead are blindfolded and placed next to the entrance of the home as to keep guard watching over families and friends th- throughout the memorial service. So you were in their mourning and they were keeping guard. They're missing their own party. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was thinking. And in other parts of the Philippines, a cigarette is placed between the deceased's lips and lit as a sign of respect. Well, it might be how you got there in the first place. (laughs) Sky burials in Mongolia, it's pretty much like this Tower of Silence. They leave the body in a high, unprotected place exposed to the elements and wildlife. They may also place stones around the body to prevent evil spirits from getting in. Once the physical body is gone, the stones represent the deceased's soul. And it's considered bad karma if the family doesn't complete necessary rituals. So you have to move these stones to the top of this tower and then the body itself. The difference between this one and the Tower of Silence is I want to say these actually cut up the corpse to help the birds. I think that's a little bit of the difference, if I'm not mistaken. Now we're getting to the exploding caskets. This is more of my area of other little facts that... I couldn't find a place for, but wanted to add in. Okay, I can handle that. (laughs) It's called exploding casket syndrome. Natural gases, including methane, occur when the body decomposes. 
the gases inside the casket can blow the lids off of the casket and also off of the marble door panels can be blown off of crypts sometimes. Imagine standing outside, grieving your loved one, and all of a sudden the door flies open with a massive boom and then crushes you. Yes. There is also a story that I read. A man in Texas, he died, and he actually exploded in the funeral home while the service was taking place. Oh, no. And it was a whole big deal because obviously the family is traumatized and they also mentioned that they saw he was buried in his underwear, which the fact that they mentioned that, I'm assuming they he probably wasn't supposed to be. Yeah. Yes. But he was, it said that he was not properly embalmed and that's why this happened. Yeah. That, but apparently yeah. this family had problems with proper care of his body even before he got out of the home because he died at home. Okay. Hopefully they're properly compensated. Yeah. Man. I don't know how be... you would be properly compensated after that being. No. So. And the smell alone because it's That's gases. what they said because I'm guessing some of them were in another room when they heard this explosion, but they were like this. There was this god awful foul odor. How hot had it been? It was Texas. Okay. Though we don't know if this is happening under the ground because. They're under we, the ground. Yeah, they're under the ground. It's probably more likely to occur above ground in mausoleums. When the weather turns warm, the casket, especially if it's a tightly sealed casket, acts as a pressure cooker for the decomposing body inside. Yeah. Sealed caskets are pushed for above ground mausoleums to have less likely chance of decomposing odors being noticed. So that's a serious issue in warmer states. Yes. I haven't looked into how much caskets cost, but I'm assuming that these sealed ones probably cost more. And that might be a reason they're also pushed. No, um, caskets different than a coffin, right? No, the tomb, I forgot what it's called, but like mausoleum, you know, that you have their own tombs. If the casket doesn't have a way to release gas, they are more likely to explode in the warmer weather. So um, you have caskets with release valves like your Instapot? Maybe. Yeah, kind of. Oh. I think they actually do have something like, and maybe not like that, but yeah, something to release the gas. I mean, I'm sure it ain't a knob you have to turn constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this causes more of a mess and probably doesn't help with that smell they were trying to prevent in the first place. The remains at this time start to turn to goo, and this will seep out sometimes onto the mausoleum walls and drip down to the floor. Oh, well, I've never been into a mausoleum that I can think of, so... YouTube is a great place. You can see where some people have gone to mausoleums and... Um, some other interesting facts. You were asking about the caskets and coffins. A casket is the one that's shaped like a boring rectangle. The coffin one is the six-sided one that you're more likely to see in old horror films. Okay. With the little slim area at the foot and the wide part for the shoulders. Yeah. Coffins also usually do not have hinges on their lids. The lid comes completely off, unlike on a casket. In the 1700s, a change in English law allowed all people to be buried in a coffin. Previously, coffins were, for the most part, reserved for the wealthy people in society. And the poor folks were buried in a shroud or winded in a sheet. Though the casket design was started before the Civil War was a major turning point for caskets to take over coffins. Yeah. There's a theory that there were so many deaths that they wanted to make it more beautiful during this time, but I don't know about that. That sounds like it'd be a lot of busy work when there's so many. Yeah. In the late 1800s, local cabinet and furniture makers also served as undertakers, which may explain the shape of caskets now. They're more rectangle like a cabinet. I had no idea that that was part of it. That would be something I'd like to get into back then, if I ever had to go back in time. <laughs> I don't want to go back in time before air conditioning or penicillin, <laughs> but I would take up an, something like that kind of profession that was long lasting business all the time, mm. the coffin maker. Well, they were not mass produced. They were built as needed. Yeah. I'd have to make shelving or something. <laughs> the cabinet. The cabinets. Yeah, you'd have cabinets until then. And then eventually I could make ice boxes. Steel caskets first appeared in the late 1840s. Uh, the lid was made from a sheet of glass, which allowed mourners to view the, the deceased. But if something like an accident happened, and it was not a pleasant sight, 
I'm hoping that they had options for not glass. That way it's oh, like surely, closing yeah. it and you're like, oh, I don't want to see this. You close it and you're like, well, that didn't do any good. Yeah, they had to have just had the stock model without the, the yeah. sunroof. The sunroof. And it's just going to be covered up <laughs> unless you put them in a mausoleum. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's going to be covered up with dirt if you put them in the ground. So you have to put them in a mausoleum, I'm guessing. If you're wealthy enough to have one, surely you'd have a mausoleum. Maybe. I don't know how much they cost, so who knows? I don't know. During the Civil War in the late 1860s, caskets began being mass-produced to keep up with the demands from the death of the war. The undertaker stopped producing the caskets and focused more on the taking care of the deceased part. By the beginning of the 20th century, caskets had completely overtaken coffins. If I am not cremated, I want a coffin. I'm going to be deliberately obtuse. <laughs> You may have that option. There's more about the dead around the world. Um, I said there's a lot to say about them. Some parts of Indonesia, loved ones will care for their deceased ancestors. They will pretty much dig them up, wash them, dress them in their finest clothes or in a fresh cloth and keep insects away. Have them participate in celebrations. Take care of them as if they were ill and not deceased. In Madagascar, there's this thing called turning up the bones. They would exhume the dead bodies every seven or so years and wrap them in fresh cloth. They would have a feast with them, and they would also dance with them. <laughs> they also did this during the bubonic plague, which probably didn't turn out well. I don't know. Can you catch it from direct contact with other people? I guess it depends on how long they were dead, dead before you did this. And that's all I have for you. I've been educated in a lot of things, the difference between coffin and casket. Did you learn anything cool about this that you didn't know about? Uh, I learned. Almost all of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned a lot. I knew about the Irish one where they cover the windows and the mirrors. And I've seen it depicted in media, but never heard about it. Uh, for the most part, the others I learned quite a bit about. Well, what do you want to do next week? I think next week I'm simply going to do last words. And maybe unusual deaths. I don't want to say funny deaths because some of them are not funny. Okay. Well, we'll go from there. I've enjoyed this. I've learned a lot, like I said. And I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Unless my husband dies or my fiance dies and I have to go. Immolate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not do that. Um, or cut a finger off. Because well, I feel like I'm not going to talk to nobody. still work if you yet. do that. <laughs> There's no reason not to record if you've just if lost a finger. You just lost a finger. You better work. Yeah. You better work. <laughs> um, but anyway, I've been Ramey. I'm Beth. Thank you for listening. We hope you join us again next week. 